This book that we're here to launch today, Shane O'Mara's Why Torture Doesn't Work, has been most eagerly awaited. And it has already received extensive uh, and indeed highly favorable reviews in the international uh, mainstream media and uh, from specialist science journals. And uh, it's not hard to see why. In a way, this is a book the world has been waiting for. Torture has been outlawed under the Geneva Convention since 1949, but torture has not disappeared. It is perpetuated under euphemisms like um, inhuman and degrading treatment, uh, which is what the Human Court of Human Rights termed interrogation practices in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, and more, uh, in more modern times, enhanced interrogation techniques a term used, uh, of course, in Guantanamo Bay. Countries, at least in democracies, uh, torture is not employed lightly. And uh, we take um, uh, recourse to euphemisms like the ones I've just described because we know it's shameful. It's employed in extreme situations when Democracies are under threat from terrorism. Some make the argument that an extraordinary situation needs an extraordinary response or special powers, which is another euphemism. For some, the end justifies the means. If torture keeps our democracies safe, then, then we must learn to stomach it. I'm reminded here of Auden's uh, great poem from the 1930s, and if I may be allowed to quote the verse. And, the, and gentle do not care to know where Poland draws its eastern bow, what violence is done, nor ask what doubtful act allows our freedom in this English house, our picnics in the sun. We need our freedom. We need our picnics. And it takes a particular courage to argue against the doubtful acts. For centuries, people, including Auden, found this courage and made the moral arguments. But how wonderful now to find science riding to the rescue of ethics. Shane O'Mara has written this important book demonstrating that not only is torture ethically repugnant, it doesn't work. It's not the way to get to the truth. Quite the contrary. He quotes of all people, Napoleon Bonaparte, the barbarous custom of having men beaten who are suspected of having important secrets to reveal must be abolished. The poor wretches say anything that comes into their mind and what they think the interrogator wishes to know. What Napoleon knew from observance, Professor Shane O'Mara now proves through his outstanding knowledge of the brain. I will leave it to Shane and Professor English to outline arguments in this book, which have been hailed by prestigious global science magazines, including Nature, Science, and New Scientist. This is not surprising. Shane O'Mara is Professor of Experimental Brain Research here in Trinity and Director of the Trinity College Institute for Neuroscience. He's a Fellow of Trinity College, a member of the Royal Irish Academy, and recipient of a Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator Award, the first recipient in Ireland of this prestigious award. He has worked extensively with the biopharmaceutical industry to develop drug therapies to ameliorate brain aging and depression. In short, he is a luminary of this university and we're extremely proud of him and the work he does. The review of this book by Science Magazine notes that the subtitle, The Neuroscience of Interrogation, underestimates the book's range because in addition to neuroscience, it says, O'Mara draws on cognitive, social, and clinical psychology 
to document his case against the efficacy of torture. In Trinity, we are proud of our interdisciplinarity, of our initiatives to, cross, uh, to facilitate cross-disciplinary and cross-faculty collaboration. In this book, Shane has effortless, effortlessly brought all of this to bear uh, and bringing all the relevant disciplines together to make his argument. Here is the case against torture, the legal, ethical, philosophical, scientific, psychological, neurocognitive, and empirical case against it. This book is already being hailed with relief and admiration by campaigners everywhere. It will be difficult, I think, to keep track of its citations in the scientific press and in the courts and in journals and in parliaments around the world. I congratulate Shane O'Mara on behalf of Trinity, and I thank him for the work he has done. And it's now my pleasure to invite Ian Malcolm to take the floor. Ian is executive editor at large and executive editor for economics with Harvard University Press, which has the distinction of publishing this book. We're delighted that Ian is here in Dublin for this launch. So please take the podium. Here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the publisher to say a few words. Uh, Richard English will say something uh, in a few minutes about the subject of the book. Uh, I'd like to say something more briefly, if I can put it this way, on the bookiness of the subject. Uh, at uh, Harvard uh, University Press, most of the books that we publish are ones that we go out looking for or that we find through our established networks. There's relatively little manna that falls from heaven. Shane's book is an exception. Uh, he wrote an email out of the blue uh, a couple of years ago. We spoke a uh, day or two later, and it was uh, clear uh, immediately uh, that this, he was onto a subject that needed a book. And, uh, um, uh, and that uh, uh, in addition to doing all the remarkable tasks that scientists uh, do, counting and filling out grant applications and uh, pressing buttons on expensive machines. He can write. And uh, that's, uh, that's n not as uh, uh, common as it, as it would be in an ideal world among scientists. Uh, we feel very lucky to have found a, a, um, a, a, a person who could combine the arts of communication and uh, the rigors of science uh, in the way that Shane can. Uh, it's a book that's just only on the market. It's already selling briskly, and as you've heard, has got wonderful reviews from uh, newspapers and scientific magazines on both sides of the ocean. The reviews make it clear that it indeed is a subject uh, that needs a book, and a book like this needs an author like uh, Shane. Uh, there are many books on torture, almost all of them damn torture morally, uh, but uh, put the question of whether it works to the side, inviting the reply from the self-appointed authorities on the way the world works uh, to um, uh, tell people that, cru uh, that, that uh, torture is a cruel necessity. Uh, and uh, Shane, as a scientist, as somebody who can bring uh, the, the rigors of his work uh, to the subject, is able to turn the tables on these people and uh, tell them precisely what they're used to telling other people, which is that you have to face the facts. These are the facts. Torture doesn't work. And I hope the book goes on to sell many more copies. You can do your part afterwards uh, outside. Uh, and uh, that Shane gets many more good reviews because both he and it are doing some good in the world. Thank you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the, uh, um, to launch the book, Richard English, the Ward Law Professor of Politics in the School of International Relations and Director of the Handa Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews. Born in Belfast and previously a lecturer in Queen's University, Belfast, Professor English is one of the world's foremost authorities on political violence and terrorism. 
He is an author of a definitive history of the IRA and is currently working on research for a book to be published by Oxford University Press entitled Does Terrorism Work a History? We are honoured to have him here with us this evening to launch this book. Please, Professor Lee. Thank you very much indeed, Provost, for those gracious remarks. It's a real honour to be here in this wonderful university to say some honest and enthusiastic things about this brilliant and attractively priced book. <laughs> this is a deeply original, extremely important piece of work on an undeniably vital subject. Shane O'Mara's Why Torture Doesn't Work, The Neuroscience of Interrogation is that rare thing it's a book which decisively alters the way in which we all now have to think about a major phenomenon. As Ian has mentioned, there are many books on torture. Some of them argue the case against torture on the grounds of morality. Some of them argue the case for torture on the grounds of necessity. Some of them in recent years in particular have discussed torture from the perspective of philosophical thought experiments, or from the perspective of political science game theory. Professor O'Mara's approach is pioneeringly different. What he does is take on the best public kind of argument there is for torture, which is this is a necessary way of extracting specific information from individuals against their will, and looks through the knowledge that he has, which most of us lack, and which certainly I lack, of what happens in the brain when people are actually tortured, to ask the central question, does torture actually work? Now, Shane will talk in more detail and with certainly greater authority than I can about the neuroscience of the brain. But to a lay reader like myself, with an interest in the phenomenon of this process of gruesome human interaction, it centrally and powerfully emerges through this erudite study that the very things that torture distinctively does to the brain make it much less likely, if not impossible, that the tortured person can give the torturer what they're ostensibly actually wanting. That your capacity to remember, to be precise about, to elucidate and to hand over precise information is rendered extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, by the very thing which is supposedly forcing you to do all of that. Now, we all exist, as Shane Whitterly points out in his book, we all exist here uh, in the shadow of those fantastically scholarly influences of people like Jack Bauer in the series 24, where films and TV representations have repeatedly presented torture as something which is necessary in extraordinary circumstances to elicit information. What Shane does empirically, rigorously, on the basis of hard evidence rather than Hollywood narrative or the intuitions of certain hard-edged people in the CIA is to show what's actually going to happen when you do this, what actually has happened when people have done this, and why torture does not work. There are many other things you can want to get out of torture apart from getting information. You can want to exact punishment on somebody whom you despise. You can, as the torturer, derive a certain cathartic satisfaction from the sadist pleasure of being cruel to people. You can display power. You can, if you want to, get confessions if you don't care about the accuracy of those confessions. But as I say, what this book does is say that the basic argument that torturers use, which is most credible, that we need to do this in order to save lives elsewhere, that it's necessary, is it seems to me fatally damaged by this book. Now, why, have, why is this so important? I want briefly to set out, very briefly to set out, three reasons which struck me when I read this book as to why this is not only a powerful book, but a book of high importance for us all. The first reason is to do with my own subject of interest and expertise, which is countering terrorism. Both this century and the last century began with an act of non-state terrorism, state responses to which dramatically and in bloodstained ways changed the world. This reflects the fact that state reactions to terrorism are far more decisive in changing history than our acts of non-state terrorism themselves. Indeed, it was aspects of what happened in the global war on terror, 
with particularly American interrogations of people, as the provost has said, euphemistically referred to as enhanced interrogation <laughs> techniques, uh, which elicited Shane's initial scholarly interest in writing so learnedly on this subject. But if torture does not work, then that's vitally important for states which are countering terrorism. <coughs> Moreover, if, as I would argue in my own work, torture tends to work best for the tortured in the sense that it undermines those states which use it in terms of degrading the culture of those states and giving gifts to their non-state violent opponents, then torture is something which we should all eschew lastingly. But the second point is that torture goes way beyond countering terrorism, and it long predates modern terrorism. As one of the things in this book that's most interesting to me is exactly how long this has been going on for how many kinds of different activity, people who were suspected or alleged of being witches in the early modern people, people who were religious heretics, people who opposed the Soviet Union, people who, as has been mentioned, people who fell on the wrong side of the British military in Belfast in uh, the early 1970s, certainly people who fell on the wrong side of the IRA or loyalist paramilitaries during the 1970s and 1980s. Very many agents historically, states, non-states, religious people, secular people, left-wing people, right-wing people, military, civilians, have used and continue to use torture. It is a big part of what our species does. And if Shane's book is right, we need to rethink it. And thirdly, the provost again mentioned this very helpfully about multidisciplinarity. Um, academics like myself always say we love multidisciplinarity, but the temptation is in the meantime just to do your own discipline and talk to people whom you like. And you tend to find that the political scientists don't talk enough to the historians and the anthropologists never talk to the philosophers and no one talks to the economists half the time. Okay? <laughs> what we've got here is a book which, though written by a brilliant neuroscientist, has detonating implications for people who work in international relations, people who work in contemporary history, people who work in philosophy and discuss these questions, people who work in political science and discuss these questions. So as a political historian who works in an international relations department, I've already been telling my students at the University of St. Andrews, you cannot understand the, the terrorist and counter-terrorist aspects of torture unless you read this book. So the book tells us things of high importance about countering terrorism. It tells us high important things about our species and what we've done to each other across the globe and continue to do. And it's also important within the academy because it demonstrates the vital, crucial capacity of people to produce work which goes beyond their disciplinary boundaries. Shane describes this book as a brain's eye view of torture, which I think is a great strap line. In closing, what I would say is that this scholarly extraordinarily readable and despite its grisly subject very enjoyable book is something which I think you should all read it's something which you should certainly all buy and I would like you now to join me please in all congratulating Shane O'Mara on having written this very powerful important book and now um, I seem to I'm happy to act as MC. I rarely do it. It's a great uh, opportunity to uh, have the chance to say here how much I've, I'm in, uh, looking forward to hearing what uh, Professor Shane O'Mara has to say. Uh, I think we're going to have some slides and so on that uh, will um, take us through uh, some of Shane's ideas. Uh, a brain's eye view of torture will be, I think, one of the tweets coming out of this evening. So without any further ado, I now invite the book's author, Shane O'Mara, to give us further insight into his research and findings. Shane. Maybe you can now. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Provost, and thank you, everybody else. I really appreciate your very, very kind words. Uh, I thank my wife and daughter who are over there. She's being very quiet, uh, which is great. She's colouring at the moment. Uh, um, so it, it's. I feel like somebody else wrote this book, um, given what's just been said uh, about its wonderful and amazing properties and perhaps uh, world-changing qualities and all the rest of it. But uh, anyway, so what I'd like to do just for the next 20 minutes or so is uh, talk about uh, why torture doesn't work in my view and to talk about the neuroscience of interrogation and to take seriously the idea that uh, what we really need to do is to look 
at interrogation as a, a problem for the brain and behavioral sciences, not a problem for legal scholars, not a, sco a problem for ethicists. This is a central brain and behavioral sciences problem. And uh, that's what I hope to do over the, the, the next 20 minutes. I, I'm a scientist. I, I can't talk without slides. I originally was going to do an address, and then I thought I tried it, and that just didn't work. I can't talk the way uh, <laughs> Richard or uh, uh, Ian can do it. So I, I'm, I'm going to do uh, this uh, the way a scientist will do. So I'm actually going to leave the stage so I can point up here at various things that I want you to look at. And hopefully, you can still continue to hear me. OK, so where do we start? Well, I think this is the best place to start. This is the United Nations uh, Convention Against Torture. Uh, it was signed uh, about 30 years ago. And it's a really, really important statement uh, uh, by the, the world community against torture. And uh, we just, I'll read through some of the points of it. I'm not going to read it exhaustively because it's quite long. But it's uh, any act by which severe pain or suffering, uh, and keep that word in mind, suffering, whether it's physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted, inflicted on a person uh, to get from them or a third person information or a confession. Uh, and it goes on and it, it uh, includes the kinds of things that you would expect. And it's a, it's a very, very good uh, definition. So we'll, uh, as I get into my talk, what I want to do is exclude certain things. I'm not going to talk uh, really much about legal matters, political matters. Uh, Jack Bauer has already been brought up. Um, as I document in the book and as others do, Jack Bauer gave people ideas. Um, and you have a very, very sad situation where uh, Antonin Scalia, who's a, a US Supreme Court justice, uh, talks about Jack Bauer as if Jack Bauer was real. Uh, Jack Bauer was made up. Uh, he's fiction. He doesn't exist. Uh, and we can't take ideas from Bauer and actually treat them as serious where interrogation is concerned. Uh, the other thing I want to do is uh, talk about what torture means in neuroscientific terms. Uh, Torture is not a neuroscience phrase. It's not something you'll find in the textbooks. What you will find, though, are concepts like stress, stressors, pain, and anxiety. And these map very well onto brain states and map very well onto bodily states. And we can understand these, we can measure these, and we can look at the effects of these. Uh, and uh, that is another consequence. I'm going to set aside the moral argument. Uh, there's plenty of moral arguments out there against torture. Uh, there are plenty of moral arguments in favor of torture. Alan Dershowitz, for example, has written a whole book uh, arguing in favor of torture, uh, which eventually comes down to the idea that if you want to torture, it's needed, and you must get a license from the president to do it. And the assumption is that it works. Uh, and I'm going to challenge that assumption now. Uh, now, if we just look at torture through the ages, there are lots of things, uh, lots of reasons why torture has been employed. Uh, if you want to get a confession from somebody, as a practice, torture is the best way of getting a confession out of anybody. And I'll illustrate that later in, in the talk. Uh, if you want to get Galileo to claim that the Earth does not go around the sun, bring out the rack uh, and threaten him. 72-year-old man, and uh, he will recant or abjure of the heliocentric hypothesis. And then quietly whisper under his breath, it still moves, referring to the Earth. Uh, to make people comply, a uh, fantastic uh, method of, of uh, making people comply with the wishes of a state. Uh, and finally, this is a, a picture I took in Siena uh, of a woodcut. Uh, this is somebody being punished uh, through an act of torture. The priest is blessing him here. And uh, when you hear the phrase to break somebody, this is what it means. It means being mounted on a St. Catherine's wheel and having the executioner, which is the name given to the torturer, to break all your limbs and to braid you through the wheel and then leave you uh, for the birds to eat. Uh, so that's a, another use of, of torture. Now, if we talk about media representations of torture, well, if we leave out torture porn, uh, which is something we should set aside, this is what you actually see. Torture is used invariably uh, to in the context of making people reveal the contents of their long-term memory. That's it. You don't see media representations of the show trials. You don't see people being forced to confess to something to uh, enter into a predetermined legal process. What you see is this repeatedly. And there are loads and loads of images. If, uh, if you go for, like this series ran for 12 years. And Jack uh, himself, uh, played by Kiefer Sutherland, uh, uh, extracted confessions and, or sorry, extracted uh, information repeatedly from individuals under duress, uh, under lots of different circumstances. And then, of course, was uh, in a plot twist, was subjected to torture himself. Um, here's a different way of looking at torture. Uh, 
This is a, a film, when people talk about torture for information, that I always recommend that people should look at. Um, Mel Gibson here, uh, in a rare metacognitive act for him, he, he doesn't have this capacity in his real life, lies under the threat, I, uh, lies actually after having been tortured with a hammer um, in a really, really gruesome uh, sequence, in order to convince his torturers of the truth of what he's about to say, in order to deliver them into the ticking time bomb, which they don't know is there. Um, so if you, if you think the ticking time bomb is real, you need to watch more movies, is uh, at least one lesson that I want to give you here. Um, and of course, uh, Casino Royale has an infamous uh, uh, torture sequence. Uh, those of you who have seen it will, will remember it. Now, again, the key point that I want to get back to is this. If we're torturing somebody to get to know or to force them to reveal what they know, what we're trying to do is to get them to tell us what's in their long-term memory. Uh, by long-term memory, I mean memories that extend at least over one sleep-wake cycle. Uh, okay, that, that's all. I don't mean anything more complicated than that, but it must be over one sleep-wake cycle. And we know lots about how the brain sustains and supports memories now, and how badly uh, the brain supports and sustains memories. Um, the type of memory that people are interested in is this type, declarative memory. Facts that you can declare about yourself and about others and events that you can declare. And we know what part of the brain uh, this type of memory depends on. It depends on a set of structures here in the temporal lobe, here beside the temple, and damage to these structures causes uh, uh, a profound, enduring, and non-resolving amnesia. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, as I talk a, a little bit further on. Okay, now what do we know about memory? We know lots now. Uh, and I'll just say a couple of quick points. First of all, this structure, the hippocampal formation, is central to memory. And we know that in order for your memory to work normally, you must have regular, reliable uh, sleep. If you're sleep deprived, your functions of your memory decline in direct proportion to the dosage of sleep deprivation that is imposed upon you which would make you wonder why sleep deprivation is ever considered as a tool for accessing long-term memories. Um, and we know that these areas interregulate prefrontal cortex, hippocampal formation, and they do so within a very narrow uh, operating band. So again, I'll make the case, if torture is the attempt to force information from the unwilling, it is by definition the attempt to force information retrieval from the memory systems of the brains of the unwilling. It cannot be anything else. Now, democracies, when they torture, use white tortures. Uh, they typically do not use tortures that leave visible marks. And in some senses, this is a, uh, a much greater cruelty perpetuated by democracies compared to other kinds of tortures, because these kinds of tortures attack you at your uh, physiologic and metabolic core. So things like being suffocated, uh, Inducing air hunger, uh, really a terrible thing to do to somebody. Uh, bringing, um, inducing repeatedly the feeling of death. And I'll talk about the physiology of this in a moment. Uh, forcing you into cramped confinement. Um, so you're put in a small uh, overheated box uh, and kept there for days to hours. You can't sleep, uh, you, uh, you dehydrate, all of those kinds of things. Being forced into stress positions. Um, for days to hour, or, uh, sorry, hours to days at a time, typically while you're naked, typically while you're uh, being uh, played very loud music, typically while you're being frozen, and typically while you're being forced to wear uh, an adult nappy or an adult diaper. And then there are lots of other things that, that can be done as well. The point is, though, that all of these tortures are without surface marks. Uh, you come out of this intervention, and there will be no visible marks, whereas, uh, the standard black tortures will leave scarring, uh, they will leave visible uh, tracks of their presence. How does this get happen? How does it happen? Well, how it happens is this. A mid-level lawyer named John Yu asks, this, in this case, the CIA what they want to be allowed to do. He writes a memo. In fact, he wrote uh, quite a few memos. His boss, uh, Jay Bybee, signs it, and this now becomes law. And these memos are widely available online, and uh, it's worth your while taking them out and having a look at them, uh, because they articulate in great detail the reasons why torture might be employed. Um, and the model is very straightforward, very simple. It's the idea 
simply that somebody possesses information. By definition, as I've already said, this is in their long-term memory. Uh, they withhold it under questioning. And if you apply certain nonverbal techniques, the kinds of things that we've already talked about, that will force them to comply with the wishes um, of the interrogator. Um, and some of these phrases I've actually taken from the torture memos. It's the idea that inducing shock, stress, anxiety, disorientation, uh, some degree of pain and lack of control is much more effective for accessing uh, the long-term memories of these detainees than uh, uh, standard uh, interrogatory techniques or new interrogatory techniques. Okay, I've mentioned the word stress. I'm just going to briefly define it. Uh, stress consists of a state of heightened arousal in the body. Um, and we can measure it in a variety of different ways, uh, but it's also combined with uh, two other important things. It's the perception that what's about to you, about to happen to you at present or in future, is going to be noxious in some way. It's going to be very unpleasant. Uh, and it's combined with a lack of control uh, over what's about to happen to you. And the body initiates a response set of activations happening here. And importantly, prolonged exposure, as I will now show you, to stress hormones damages the very fabric of the brain, and in particular the brain regions that are involved in intention and in memory and in the regulation of mood. So here's an example. This is a, a study uh, by uh, Sonia Lupian from a, a number of years ago. And uh, what she did in this study was very simple. Uh, she uh, got people to wear a catheter circulating levels of stress hormones were measured, and she divided them, the population that she gathered into two groups, a group uh, that had low to moderate levels of circulating stress hormone and a group that had high levels. And what you see is the hippocampal formation here has shrunk, the ventricle has enlarged compared to the group that have low levels of stress hormones. And this group have a surprisingly compromised long-term memory. Their capacity to remember what happens to them on a daily basis is really surprisingly compromised. Now, you could argue that this is only epidemiology and that would be reasonable. So you need to look at some interventional studies. So if we take volunteers to the lab and we give them, uh, uh, these are uh, Dominic de Curvain studies, um, we give them acute hydrocortisone, or just so hydrocortisone tablets uh, to induce high levels of stress hormones. In a very simple task uh, where you just have to learn word pairs, uh, at 24 hours, people who've been exposed to the cortisone compared to placebo are performing at about 50 to 60% of uh, the normal control. So that's the effect of an acute administration of stress hormones. Now, if we take a different population and say, well, maybe there's something wrong with th those students or th that population, let's look at uh, elite soldiers. And this is a great, a great study. Charles Morgan, whose work I cite extensively in the book, has done many, many studies like this. Uh, what he has done is taken uh, uh, elite soldiers, and they've been exposed to simulated combat using real ammunition and real explosives. They're kept awake for a minimum of 48 hours. Uh, they're heated because they're wearing full battle dress. So they're, not, they're extensively sleep deprived. They're hugely dehydrated. They're not fed properly. And he asks, what is the effect of this on every aspect of psychological function? And this is what you find for every single class of psychological function that you focus on, irrespective of whether it's simple reaction time or it's something complex, uh, like your ability to control your own mood. Every single one of these is dramatically uh, and substantially impaired. And the impairment takes from days to weeks uh, to recover. And this is in a group that are prepared by training for this. i uh, give you a, simple, a different example, uh, also from Morgan's study. This is a, an example of a visual spatial task. Um, so you're given this rather complicated diagram to look at. It's called the Ray Osterath figure. Uh, and uh, 
You study it for a couple of minutes, and then an hour later, a day later, a week later, whatever it happens to be, you're required to recall this figure, and it can be scored in reliable ways. And we know that people with hippocampal damage perform astonishingly badly when replicating this uh, uh, diagram after a delay. In combat soldiers who haven't been stressed, this is what you find. Pretty good replication. This is the best performance that you get uh, from uh, a combat soldier who has been stressed. They're really very, very poor at just recalling a simple visuospatial figure. Now, let's talk about waterboarding. The, the phrase to waterboard came from Alan Dershowitz, um, uh, the, the uh, original conversion of it into a verb. And this is an example. It, it, this is a torture that goes back thousands of years. There are examples of it being used in South America. Uh, there are examples. This is a, a figure from uh, Cambodia. Um, and uh, it's one that people spontaneously uh, use. Uh, so what happens in waterboarding? You're bound securely on an inclined bench. Uh, your feet are elevated, a cloth is placed over your forehead and eyes, and water is poured on you. Uh, and you would think there is no empirical studies on waterboarding. Well, actually, in point of fact, surprisingly, there are plenty of studies that are very relevant to the experience of being waterboarded. Um, this position is actually known as the Trendelenburg position. It was invented for uh, people suffering hypoperfusion of the brain, and the idea is that it would allow you uh, to increase blood flow uh, to the brain. Problem is, uh, it actually is a very dangerous position uh, to put people in. It's very difficult to clear the airways, and uh, all the evidence shows that actually, because of the relative change in orthostatic blood pressure, you get pooling of fluid in the, the upper body, which you shouldn't have. You don't get normal recirculation. So we, we already know uh, that this is a dangerous position, and it's a position that's not uh, mandated under surgical procedures anymore, and hasn't been for quite some time. Um, in waterboarding, of course, what happens is the uh, oropharynx is occluded, uh, and water uh, can be admitted through the, uh, the, the nasal sinuses and uh, through the mouth, and uh, it, in turn, will block uh, the oropharynx and probably the upper the trachea and probably the upper third of the uh, respiratory system. Now, I want you to think about coughing uh, when you're in this position, uh, when the trachea is filled with water. It's an impossibility uh, because if you want to cough, you have to inhale. Uh, and if you inhale, you will inhale water. Um, so keep that in mind when I talk about the, the next point. So. Uh, there is a literature relevant to uh, waterboarding, and this is a literature that uh, we get from the military who are interested in extreme performance in Navy divers, and there's a literature uh, which is uh, available in non-military uh, sports divers. Um, and what you find when you are immersed in water, and we all know this intuitively, uh, if you take uh, you throw water, cold water about the face, water that has a, a temperature below the ambient temperature of the air, you take a breath. That's called the diving reflex, and it's a, it's a reflex that's been given, or which has evolved to allow us to uh, survive in, in uh, conditions where we have whole head immersion in water. Um, if you're dunked in cold water, uh, this is a very fit young male subject dropped into water at 11 degrees C. Uh, what you find is uh, this chap is only able to hold his breath for a maximum of 23 seconds, and this is voluntary circumstances. Now, this is what being waterboarded is actually like. This is Christopher Hitchens, who, who died a number of years ago. Voluntarily uh, was waterboarded. And you can see his uh, feet are above the level of his head. The, so he lasted about 14 seconds uh, before dropping, uh, uh, engaging the dead man's drop. And you can see uh, uh, from that short experience, he. Uh, didn't have a pleasant time. It's uh, annoying to me now to read every time it's discussed in the press or in Congress that it simulates the feeling of drowning. It doesn't simulate the feeling of drowning. You are being drowned slowly. Now, this is a quote, again, from the uh, uh, museum in Siena. Uh, there's a waterboard, which you can just about see in the background there. And uh, it says, among the most atrocious ordeals was and is the water torture. The terror of drowning endlessly repeated is by itself an agonizing torment. 
The victim is tilted head down. Uh, that should be so that the pressure on the heart and lungs causes unimaginable anguish, which the executioner exacerbates by beating on the abdomen. Now, Hitchens found that when he tried to prevent uh, himself choking on, on the water, that uh, he would be struck in the solar plexus uh, by uh, his water border uh, colleagues uh, so that he couldn't game the, uh, the waterboarding system. Now, what I would claim, and I think it's reasonable, is that waterboarding is a very severe, extreme stressor, and it can cause widespread changes in the brain, um, especially if this is done repeatedly uh, and if it's done frequently and intensively. So uh, here's uh, some examples from the Senate torture report. This is Abu Zubaydah, who became completely unresponsive with bubbles rising through his open, full mouth. And critically, no useful information. Uh, they got absolutely nothing from him. Uh, are you surprised? Remarkably, he vomited uh, the food that he had consumed 10 hours previously. That should have passed all the way through his gastric tract. Uh, so uh, uh, this kind of reverse emis or, uh, reversal of, the, of, of uh, normal gastric motility under these circumstances just shows the extremity that the body has been pushed to. Now, air hunger is a part of uh, uh, the, the whole waterboarding, uh, for a better word, experience. Uh, and this is the frantic search for air. It's got the technical name of, of dyspnea. This is a, a clip, uh, again, from 24. And this is a, uh, you know, an amazing form of torture because uh, every cell in our body requires oxygen, and it requires it continually. Um, and if, it, if we're denied oxygen, uh, we fight for oxygen quickly. Um, now, what happens in the brain uh, when you undergo dyspnea? Well, volunteers step forward, uh, and they volunteer for these kinds of things, and the brain has been imaged uh, during this experience. And uh, what we see particularly is the amygdala is activated uh, during uh, uh, dyspnea, the experience of being oxygen uh, restricted. In other words, the part of the brain that's principally concerned with the perception of fear and stress. Sleep deprivation, I've mentioned briefly already. There's a huge literature on the effects of sleep deprivation in normal volunteers, in shift workers, in soldiers and others. Uh, the key thing I'll just bring out of this simple little slide is that chronic insomniacs, people who uh, uh, go without sleep for days at a time, have shrunken hippocampi on average, and their memory is very, very poor. They are very, very bad at remembering where and when they are, and uh, they're very bad at situating themselves on a timeline from the future, or from the present into the past, and from the present into the future. And their item-specific recall is dramatically impaired. Um, I'm going to, I realize I'm going on a little bit uh, here, so I'm going to just skip through a couple of slides. Th this is just to talk about the idea that uh, uh, when you're being tortured, one of the key things that you should do is talk. And one of the things that a torturer is very bad at doing is detecting lying. Um, this is uh, uh, somebody who was tortured in Cambodia, and uh, he makes a couple of key points. His, he told his interrogators everything they wanted to know, including the truth, but they don't stop. Because typically and routinely, you were disbelieved. Uh, and under torture, he confessed to being a hermaphrodite, a CIA spy, a Buddhist monk, Catholic bishop, and the son of the king of Cambodia. Uh, and this is a, a guy who... Uh, uh, was a school teacher who had glasses, uh, which marked him out as an intellectual, uh, and that he once spoke French. And he remembered the barrel version of waterboarding, head first until the water filled the lungs, and then you talk. Now, what's it like to do this to somebody else? Well, it's actually remarkably, and this is something I treat at length in the book, subjecting another human being to these kinds of, of uh, tortures is actually remarkably stressful. And there is a literature uh, uh, on the effects of these kinds of uh, imposing these kinds of stressors on others. Uh, I've just noted this guy here. This is Vasily Blocken, for any of you who uh, don't recognize him. He killed himself in 1955. He was the chief torturer and executioner uh, in the Lubyanka under Stalin, and uh, is estimated to have murdered more people individually than any other person who ever lived. And uh, he died, quote, insane, uh, which is, I think, a remarkable position to be in. Now. Why does this happen? Well, here's a possible reason. I think it's a reasonable reason. Uh, when we watch other people in pain, uh, when we see somebody else suffering, uh, if you're watching a football match and you see an accidental leg break, you hear the crowd all going <gasps> very suddenly. Uh, why is that? Well, the reason is very simple. 
Um, pain can be dissociated into a couple of components. There's a sensory side of pain. We all know that. We know what it's like to be hurt um, when we cut ourselves or whatever. And there's the motoric component, um, which is the, the sudden withdrawing of your hand from the flame or whatever it happens to be. But there's another component that we always forget about because uh, we're not exactly conscious of it. And that's the cognitive component. It's the uh, representation of the pain in the brain. And what you see when you see somebody else in pain is uh, the pain matrix in our brains is activated by the seeing of distress on the face of another. Um, and it, does, it, it, it is activated reliably, uh, quickly, and automatically. And uh, to do this, uh, or to impose stressors on, on another person and to see that person in pain actually will cause you over time uh, to have your own pain matrix activated repeatedly and probably in ways that uh, you won't be entirely comfortable with. Uh, we now know, for example, that uh, the rate at which uh, ex-US servicemen are committing suicide as a result of what they did in Abu Ghraib in particular uh, is uh, astounding and there probably have been more who have committed suicide as a result of what they have done uh, in terms of prisoner abuse than uh, uh, actually died uh, during combat operations. And again, in the book, I detail uh, the psychiatric sequelae that are very, very common in ex-torturers. The, the, what happens to them at that particular moment in time may not be entirely obvious, but in democracies where you don't have secret uh, societies of, of torturers to give comfort and social support to each other, um, what you have is a, a widespread phenomenon of moral injury or psychic injury in uh, these ex-servicemen. And it, it's turning out in many countries to be a, a particular problem. Um, I, uh, after one of the reviews of my book was published uh, just recently, uh, one of the commentators uh, said what we should do is actually not use white tortures. We should do what was done in Marathon Man. Uh, and if any of you remember Marathon Man, uh, you'll remember Laurence Olivier played a Nazi war criminal uh, who's a dentist. And uh, he drills uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman's teeth to get him to reveal information. Now, of course, what the uh, commenter forgot was that the, Hoffman didn't have the information that he wanted. Um, so what he did to him was actually pointless and uh, uh, didn't allow him to get the information that he wanted. Now, do we know what happens in the brain when something like this happens? Well, actually, we do, remarkably. Um, the fantastic study done a couple of years ago in uh, Switzerland asked volunteers to come to the lab and wear this dental splint. You see these little contact points. These are electrodes uh, where uh, you uh, can self-shock your own teeth. Uh, and they did a number of things in this study. First of all, they asked people to estimate how much pain they could take. Uh, and then they imaged the brain. And on average, people volunteered for twice as much pain as they thought they could take to begin with. But also, uh, when you image the brain, this is what you find. You get a huge activation in posterior regions of the, uh, of the brain, brain regions that are not concerned with learning and memory, not concerned with mood, but actually concerned with uh, in, in kind of uh, an immediate axis of reflexive survival in the brain. And you also get this wonderful activation in the midline uh, 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 cortices that are associated with uh, the pain matrix. Uh, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to skip that slide. So uh, we've already heard from uh, Bonaparte. I'm not going to read through the, the slide, but the, the key point is that it produces nothing worthwhile. Now, is there a better way? I think there is, and the, the obvious one is to use language. Uh, now, that seems like a very, very simple and easy thing to do, but there's a couple of things that aren't obvious about humans' use of language. The first is this, that uh, if you go out into the field and uh, you're very bold and you listen into the conversation of people in cafes, uh, in bus stops, uh, and a variety of other places, what you find is that about 40% of what one person says to another is revealing personal information about themselves. Uh, and in fact, this is something we do effortlessly. We do it without noticing it. And we do this, do this perpetually. Uh, it happens all the time. Now, can we say more than that? Well, we can. Uh, and we can say this that if we pop you in a brain scanner and we ask you to reveal information about yourself, where you went to school, nothing particularly private, versus information about public figures, what we find 
is the brain's reward system, uh, the nucleus accumbens in particular, is activated during personal disclosure, but not about disclosure of information about public figures. People, uh, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, like talking about themselves. <laughs> and they will do it to the extent that it costs them money uh, when you are in uh, a scanner where you have to make the choice between talking about yourself, talking about another, and you pay a relative penalty for revealing information about yourself versus another. Um, talking is intrinsic to what we do as humans. Now, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you all when uh, you get a chance to pop out and ha just have a look at this uh, remarkable, uh, uh, it's actually an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, Stephanie uh, Pavasek and I uh, collaborated on creating this. This is uh, the interrogation over 50 days of uh, uh, Muhammad al Qatani, uh, detainee 63. You can find his, his uh, uh, testimony online if you wish, and there's a, a book has been produced by it. And this breaks down what the amateurs uh, who were interrogating him did. Uh, uh, you can see he's extensively sleep deprived and then he has to go to hospital afterwards. Um, and you can see how uh, ineffective the uh, methods that were used uh, actually were in a really, really fine grained and quantitative way. And the thought that I want to leave you with is this, that interrogation is actually far too serious an issue to be left to amateurs. It's far too serious uh, to be left to people who uh, evolve solutions out of their inner consciousness. It's centrally a problem for the brain and behavioral sciences, uh, it, quite apart from being illegal and uh, other uh, problem. So I'm gonna uh, stop there and thank you all for coming along tonight.